Well, good morning. Uh, I'm Robert Summercraft. I'm Dean of the Terry College of Business at the University of Georgia. And um, I'm just wondering, do, do we have some uh, CPAs out uh, in the crowd with us today? Huh, wonder, wonder where they are. <laughs> Sleeping late today. Well, I want to welcome you uh, non-CPAs to uh, Terry Third Thursday this month. If, uh, as I found out, some of you are coming to this for the first time, so I also want to welcome you to the Terry Executive Education Center here in Buckhead. Uh, this is uh, our home base for programs in Atlanta. Uh, our Executive Education, uh, Executive MBA runs out here, our lots of non-credit executive programs, and it's a, a wonderful way for us to stay in touch with the business community and alumni. Um, I want to make a few announcements before we go to our speaker. We are coming up on the biggest event of the calendar for the Terry College. Uh, on April 25th, we will be having our annual alumni awards and gala uh, over at the Intercontinental. Uh, it is a sellout this year. We've been reconfiguring the room to make uh, accommodations for the people that are wanting to come. We're expecting a crowd of about 700 this year. Um, lots of uh, notable people will be there with us. We have honorary guests, including uh, Governor Perdue, Senator Isaacson, Senator Chambliss, uh, our athletic director from UGA, Damon Evans. We'll have uh, former football letter letterman from UGA, including uh, David Green and Matt Stithcombe. Um, and I am proud to say that uh, they're all UGA graduates, and five out of six are Terry College of Business graduates as well. Um, I want to briefly mention a few of the people that we'll honor at our alumni awards and gala. Uh, Davis Knox will be receiving the Young Alumni Award. Uh, Davis is a co-founder, as many of you may know, of Fire and Flavor Grilling Company along with his wife Jenna. Uh, John McMullen will be one of two Distinguished Alumni Award winners. <clears throat> John is CEO of Camden Real Estate Company and a trustee with UGA's Arch Foundation. And uh, Kessel Stelling, uh, he will also receive the Distinguished Alumni Award. Kessel is president and CEO of Bank of North Georgia and Atlanta Regional CEO for Synovus. So uh, why don't you join me in congratulating our award winners at the gala. Now this is uh, kind of a nice... Uh, segue into our Terry Third Thursday sponsors because our premier corporate sponsor of Terry Third Thursday is Bank of North Georgia. So thank you, Kessel. And uh, let's uh, recognize the people of Bank of North Georgia if they could identify themselves. Anybody here? Well, thank you for your support anyway. <laughs> We're also supported by two media sponsors. Uh, we couldn't put this program on without our, our corporate sponsors. Public Broadcasting Atlanta and the Atlanta Business Chronicle. And I know we have some representatives from them. So thank you very much. And briefly, I want to mention some of our upcoming programs. In May on the 21st, we've got Bonnie Schumann coming. She is CEO of Stratix Corporation. Uh, she's also a Terry graduate. And as many of you may know, Stratix is in the barcode business, uh, but that's not the business that she's going to be talking about. She'll be our guest to talk about work-life balance, or as she calls it, work-life juggle. Uh, next month in June, Robin Laudermilk, uh, president and CEO of Aaron Rents, will be our speaker. His topic, uh, family business as a community partner. And finally, in July, we're looking forward to having uh, Eric Zeller, Eric is now working as a vice president for Bank of America, but you know him better for his weekend job as one of the many voices, one of the newer voices, in fact, of uh, Georgia football. And Eric, of course, was also a, a four-year starting quarterback for Georgia, 91 to 94, uh, broke a lot of SEC records along the way. So we're going to be very happy to have uh, Eric with us. You can um, register for any of our Terry Third Thursdays on the website. And now, uh, without further ado, let me uh, ask uh, Cecil Cook to come up and introduce our speaker. Cecil is the co-chair of our Terry Third Thursday Alumni Task Force, and it's in that role that I'd like him to introduce the speaker. Cecil is in the first year of service on the uh, Terry Alumni Board. Uh, he's a graduate of our risk management program, and he is managing director of Aon Risk Services here in Atlanta. So, Cecil.
Thank you, Dean. Good morning. Um, I'm proud to uh, announce our speaker this morning, Jeff Gentner. Uh, if you don't know Jeff, he's a senior vice president and general manager of Fox Sports South and Sports South, so it's two different networks. He's got a 28-year history in the industry, and in talking with him this morning, he's gone from St. Louis to Chicago to New York to Florida, back to New York to Detroit, um, back to Florida, and now here, Colorado. and up, oh, left out Colorado. Uh, he's served in many capacities in the industry, uh, including running regional sports networks, uh, and also served on the uh, Olympic Committee. Um, Sports South, he's built this into the nation's largest regional sports network with over 12 million subscribers or viewers to his network. Um, and then his other job in terms of, uh, uh, and I always get this confused, Sports South, which is the old Turner South, I believe, was, was where Sports South came from. They have 9 million viewers throughout six states. Um, and he's done this in about a three-year period of time, which is pretty phenomenal. If you're a fan of the Braves, if you're a fan of the Hawks, you're a fan of the Thrashers, you've been on his, one of his networks. Uh, they televise our dogs, they televise SEC football. Unfortunately, they also televise some of the ACC stuff, but we'll forgive them for that. <laughs> but every day is game day for Jeff. His networks televise over 900 live sporting events and produce an excess of 500 original programs on an annual basis. Think about that. That's every day is game day in the world that they live in. Fox Sports and Fox Sports South have earned 14 regional Emmy Awards just in the last two years. Um, Jeff has a third job. He's the chairman of the Atlanta Sports Council. Uh, many of you probably are aware that the Sports Council is responsible for most of the large amateur events that are attracted to this city. And when I set Jeff up to come speak, uh, I'd love to be able to tell you that I had I, that I had some inside track that there may be a possibility that the uh, the Sports Council might be able to bring the Georgia Florida game here. Uh, I'm not that smart, but uh, hopefully, you know, with Jeff and. You know, maybe Robert, you can help us with Damon. We can make that a reality. Wouldn't that be great to have the Georgia-Florida game play here in Atlanta? That'd be that'd be awesome. So, <laughs> Jeff also serves as a member of the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce board, uh, and it's through that that we actually connected. Uh, Jeff's married to Renee, and uh, she has told him that should he take another position and leave, that she's really going to miss him because she's staying here in Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> They've raised two children, and we are uh, incredibly um, uh, uh, excited about having him here, and he's a great leader in our community. So, Jeff, come on up. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I am uh, I'm thrilled to be here, and I'm going to throw Cecil and everyone a curveball because um, I usually am a spokesperson for our networks, and I'm glad to talk about our networks during Q&A. But the theme today, I'm, I'm doing something that really caused me to think outside the box, and the theme today is the economic impact on sports. And so I'm going to kind of go through a 50,000-foot view. And if you want to talk about my networks, you know, schedule me back for about another five-hour period, and I'll be glad to talk about my networks. But I'm not going to—I'm not going to be a promoter today. I'm going to take a different angle. So um, I've amassed a huge amount of information. My unbelievably terrific assistant, Camille Ferguson, is here, and she's here to certify the over/under that I can get through this in a half hour. So if you see her do things like this, she just—you know—I'm she's trying to keep me flowing. I love quotes, so I decided to start with a quote, and the quote today is, I had a better year than Hoover did. Can anyone figure out who said this? Babe Ruth said it in 1930 when he was justifying his $80,000 a year salary while President Hoover, heading into the Depression, only made $75,000. So to put it into perspective, let's talk about Yankee salaries and the President's salary again. This year, President Obama makes $400,000. A-Rod will make $32 million. Now this morning over a cup of coffee and some juice, I broke that down. Alex Rodriguez doesn't get injured this year. Gets four at-bats every game, 162 games. 
that is 648 at-bats, okay? If you took his salary, $32 million, divided by 648 at-bats, what do you think he's making per at-bat? A lot. A lot. $49,000 per at-bat. So basically, eight and a half at-bats, he's already surpassed President Obama's salary for the entire year. So I guess President Hoover didn't have much to complain about because he didn't have to live in 2009. Anyway, here's the agenda for this morning. Um, I'm going to fly through kind of a, a recount of the major milestones uh, that have occurred uh, in this wonderful past six, seven months and kind of do a parallel to sport. If you have any questions, raise your hand, be glad to answer them. And then I'm going to talk about who in the world of sports is best positioned for survival and why. And I'm going to look at TV rights, corporate sponsorships, and consumers very over the top. And again, if you have any questions or have any thoughts, please don't, don't hesitate to raise your hand. And then uh, if I succeed in being in the under versus the over under, we'll, we'll do Q&A as well. So I went back to September and I looked at um, what occurred. And, and a year before September of 08, in September of 07, in our shop, in the world at Fox, we actually started to talk to ourselves and say, you know, it just feels like a recession is coming. It just, you can tell it in our business when the ad sales rates are a little tougher, the buys are a little tougher, and then the bottom fell out in September. And the U.S. government seized control of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Lehman Brothers filed for Chapter 11. They actually owed money to the White Sox and the Giants and uh, the Red Sox, among others. U.S. government led, uh, lend, uh, or loaned AIG uh, $85 billion, and the Dow dropped 778 points. Pretty bad September. The sports industry started to recover or started to respond to that. The NBA, now many people think the NBA, the NFL, NFL they're, they're going to tough this out. I mean, they make so much money. NBA immediately uh, lets go of 9% of their staff. They close the Los Angeles office. They're starting to brace for the reality of this. CBS College Sports, that's a cable network uh, that owns rights um, buys up rights for a lot of events that ESPN or Fox don't acquire, um, they immediately shut down or, or close down their studios and really become just an, an, an event business. They, they close their studio operation um, and cut 30 jobs. The NFL, the almighty NFL, immediately concerned that teams won't have enough operating cash to take out two loans. They take out a four-year loan for $1.4 billion, and then they take out another 10-year loan uh, for $460 million, realizing that the credit markets are going to freeze and that teams need the cash flow. You've got a lot of teams, remember, you've got the Giants, you've got the Cowboys, you've got the Jets all building new stadiums, their money's tied up in, in those capital, uh, capital investments. They need the money. The NFL says, we've got to brace ourselves for this. So that's October. In NASCAR, uh, heading into November, uh, NASCAR, and we'll talk about this in a second, is a sport that is extremely uh, exposed to the uh, rise and fall of sponsorship money. A and they're starting to feel the pain already. Remember, NASCAR season doesn't start until Daytona with the start of the, or excuse me, until February with the start of the Daytona 500. But already NASCAR teams are um, letting staff go. And um, when I say teams, you know, the individual race teams, in the aggregate, somewhere between 750 and 1,000 NASCAR jobs are lost, not at NASCAR, but at NASCAR teams. They also implement a policy, no testing. If you recall, if you're a NASCAR fan, what they'll do is they'll go in and they'll test the tracks, they'll test the tires. You know, NASCAR's had a history of problems with their tires. They just say, we can't afford that. Saves each team about $6 million a year, but we got to cut costs. Kind of a dangerous thing when you're driving 180, 190 miles an hour, four turns about every three seconds. You want to kind of feel good about the tires. Can't do it, can't afford it. Good luck. Buick. Um, a GM property has one of the greatest icons in sports in the history of the world, Tiger Woods, can't afford him anymore. They exit a deal with Tiger Woods one year before it's due. They were in a relationship for nine years, paying Tiger seven million dollars. Sorry, Tiger can't afford you anymore. Actually, concurrent with that, I saw this, I didn't add it, LeBron James had a sponsorship with Microsoft, and they exited that as well. So you think about these, these sports icons, great spokespeople, and major companies, Microsoft, 
can't afford LeBron James. Sorry, we're gone. Moving on to December, the WNBA, um, Houston Comets, they suspend operations. This was one of the founding franchises, uh, one of the, the, the real marquee franchises in the WNBA. We just, we can't stay in business anymore. WNBA does not have TV revenue. And that's a real problem going forward. So they're dependent on ticket sales. They're dependent on sponsorships. It's just not there. We've got we to gotta cease operations. The AFL, Arena Football, including a team we had here in Georgia for many years, they canceled the 2000, or 2009 season after 22 years. Again, doesn't have a lucrative TV contract um, and can't get the sponsorships. We see the horizon. We're just going to take a hiatus in 2009. Um, Honda. Um, pulls out of Formula One racing. Honda was hugely successful in Formula One racing. Great, great opportunity to showcase their technology. Um, Honda is known for building excellent engines, um, and they pull out of Formula One racing. And the NFL that now took that loan has already cut 150 staff members from the league office. NFL is a, by the way, I don't know if you know this, the NFL as a league is a nonprofit organization. They get money that flows up to it either from the teams sharing ticket revenue or down through the TV revenue deals. But the NFL as an entity is a nonprofit organization and, and uh, they saw the writing on the wall so they let go of 150 people. Now we go into January and these are all, you know, there's a many, many different kind of, you know, metrics I could put in here, but things that give you an indication of the market. Gambling is now hit. So the paramutual report for the thoroughbred racing industry, which is a $14, $15 billion a year industry, um, year on year in 2008 versus 2007, I'm sorry, just for the month of December, is down 20% from a year ago. The 2008 handle, total money gambled on horse racing for 2008 from the prior year is down 7%, $1 billion. That's consumer money. So you know whether you're a gambling fan or not, again, there's a metric. People who are, you know, who really invest a lot of money in that sport, they're, they're backing off. Reebok, everyone knows what Reebok is. They can't move product. They've cut sponsorships. Now they're laying off staff. Am I depressing everyone already? Sorry. You thought we were going to talk about, like, Georgia football and that no Sean Marino leap in the Central Michigan game. I'm killing you. I know I am. <clears throat> NFL, now, now that the league, now that the league has, has secured this money, to prop up the teams, the teams are trying to cut their expenses. So they've laid off anywhere between 30 and 50 jobs per team. Uh, Carolina Panthers were the first to do it, um, but, but really kind of pushed right through the league. Let's look at the media companies. The Walt Disney Company, which owns obviously ABC, uh, ESPN, their Q4 report net profits dropped 32%. ESPN is the cash cow in the Disney Company. Um, you go to Disneyland, Disney World, ABC, they've really been propped up over the years by ESPN. So ESPN has to take some of the brunt. They lay off 200 um, employees, eliminate bonuses, do those, do those types of cost-cutting measures. And CBS's Q4 report, CBS Viacom, their net profit drops 52%. <clears throat> now we head into February. Um, Detroit Pistons hugely successful franchise, had a sellout streak going back to January of 2004. That streak comes to an end. I don't think anyone needs to really dwell on how tough a market it is in Detroit um, uh, in terms of unemployment, the housing market, everything. It's just a, a horrible situation um, and obviously reflect, reflected in, in consumers' ability to, to buy tickets. The NBA takes the NFL's lead. They borrow $200 million to prop up the operating costs for 12 to 15 target teams uh, with a line of credit between 13 and 20 million dollars. Again, you know, propping up these teams in a market where you can't access uh, uh, um, uh, credit, you can't access capital. Uh, the league uses its line of credit to, to fund those teams. Um, the NFL takes even further steps. Commissioner freezes his salary, takes a 20 to 25 percent uh, compensation cut, um, now they really have deeper layoffs. They've already laid off 150 in December. Another 45 employees get laid off. 76 take severance. Uh, the league doesn't fill openings on and on and on. Nike, Nike, 1,400 jobs eliminated. EA Sports, the makers of uh, the video games, Madden NFL games that are just huge money makers. 
Uh, they lay off 1,100 employees, 11% 11 of their staff. They close 12 facilities, and their year-on-year -year, uh, net uh, uh, loss operating income goes from $33 million to $641 million. Now, in all fairness, that there's some accounting um, 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 write-offs and write-downs that occurred there, but clearly they're going in the wrong direction. Let's be fair. I work for Fox. I work for News Corp. So let's look at our company, because um, I just spent the last 12 minutes bashing everyone else. Um, we had a tough Q, um, um, uh, our second quarter fiscal year, uh, December report. Um, News Corp wrote down $6.4 billion. Now, a lot of that was done in, in write-down charges. We bought the Washington Post this past year. Um, we had some other acquisitions and other assets that we had to, to revalue, some licenses. So um, there was an accounting write-down of $8.4 billion. But in our company, there's kind of four major buckets. One bucket is film production, um, movies and DVDs. And that division is down 72% little bit behind the fact that um, a year ago or two years ago we had some pretty strong movies come out of our studios. The Simpsons actually was a huge movie for us and we really have had a tough job following that up. So it's not so much how far the movies came down in 08, it's that we had a really good 07 and a tough act to follow. But network TV, Fox Network, you know, you look at American Idol and you think, wow, they're knocking it out of the park and Idol's a great show, does very, very well for us. But in terms of Fox Network and the local TV stations like Channel 5, WAGA here in Atlanta are really struggling because of the ad market. Um, and their ad sales revenues in the Q4 report or the October, November, December report were down 19% and were projected to continue to nosedive to about 30%. And I hate to, to tell you this, but that's a pretty true projection. They're down about 30% from they, where they were a year ago. Side note, Atlanta is a market that generates, uh, 18 months ago, generated about $550 million in television advertising revenue. It's the broadcast stations, that's our networks, that's all television in the market. I would love to tell you that my networks, with a wonderful introduction to Cecil Gamey, got a bigger piece of that than we did, but it is a 500, or was a $550 million market. Today, it's about a $350 million market, a significant drop, huge drop. I mean, when you think about that much money leaving the marketplace, you know, and TV stations that are wholly dependent on advertising, that's a much smaller piece of the pie that they take. Reason for that, and we'll talk about this in a second, auto, down about 80%. Financial institutions, down significantly. Political. We're not in a presidential election year. Heading into this year, a lot of money was spent in the political race last year. And last but not least, the print unit of the Washington Post. Um, New York Post, papers in London, papers in Australia, um, Wall Street Journal, very, very tough ad market. Traditional media really taking a hard hit now. So the operating income for the print units down 9%. Wall Street Journal ad revenues are down 20%. This is where I like to talk, right here. Fox Cable Networks, our operating income is up 27%. And the Fox Cable Networks is um, the Fox News Channel. It's the Fox Sports Networks, including Fox Sports South, Sports South, and all those other ones you see right up there at the top of the screen. Um, we have 14 regional sports networks around the country. This also includes National Geographic, FX, the other Fox Cable Networks, and uh, the Big Ten Network, sorry. Um, Big Ten Network is a partnership with us and the Big Ten where we actually launched a network and I know that there were talks about the SEC doing this. We did that already out of the Midwest with the Big Ten Network. Can anyone tell me why they think that unlike film production, local and network television, print media that suffered significant losses, why the cable networks actually had a 27% operating income increase? Anyone have a guess? Yes. Uh, that's part of it. The business model is completely different. 100% dependent on consumers going to the theater or buying DVDs. 100% driven by um, the ad sales market, uh, network and local television. 100% driven by the ad sales market. When marketing budgets are cut, TV revenues are cut, TV ad buys are cut. Same thing with print media. When, when companies slash their marketing budgets, they don't buy print media. 
the business model for regional sports networks is about 80% of our revenue comes from cable operators and satellite providers that pay us to carry our networks. So the business model for Fox Sports South and Sports South is basically in a nutshell, we go out, we buy the rights to content. The SEC, the Braves, the Hawks, the Thrashers. We produce those games, we package them on a network, we sell that network to a Comcast, to a DirecTV, to a Charter, to a Dish Network, and they pay us to carry that service, which in turn establishes the value of the service you buy as a cable TV or satellite customer, so we get a license fee. And as long as you have cable in your home or you have a, a dish on your roof, I get a monthly check from Comcast for my troubles and my risk of buying those rights, producing those games. The business model for most cable networks, and this goes to ESPN as well, somewhere between 75 and 80 percent of their total revenue is a check from cable operators or, or dish networks, and the other 25 percent is from ad sales. So if my ad sales, and, and actually in my model for, for our business here in Atlanta, we're about 80 percent uh, of our revenue comes from uh, uh, cable operators or direct TV or dish network or what have you across the seven state region that, that, that Cecil mentioned earlier, 20 percent of our revenue is variable revenue. Twenty percent of our revenue is is subjected to the ebb and flow of the ad market. So when the ad market crashes thirty percent, it's only affecting that thirty percent is only affecting twenty percent of my income stream, my revenue stream. That's why we've had a, a, a good year and we still we continue to invest very heavily in, in rights in our product because it's so important for us to have those rights and, and to keep keep the value of our network strong. My focus absolutely is on ad sales, no doubt about it. But my bigger focus is investing in content that sustains the distribution of my networks. I want my networks not only to be in Atlanta and throughout Georgia, but I need to make sure I've got product that keeps my networks in Alabama, Mississippi, Kentucky, Tennessee, because that distribution is, you know, contributes to the 80% of my revenue stream. So that's the, the basic business model difference between Fox cable networks or cable networks in general and traditional media of television, um, print, what have you. All right, let's talk about positioning for survival. As we head deeper into the, the, the market, the challenges of the economy, what businesses, particularly what leagues, are best positioned for survival? So I'm going to give you a real quick run through on, on TV rights, and then we're going to talk about sponsorships, and we're going to talk about consumers. NFL is in great shape. And the reason they're in great shape is, first of all, whoops, sorry about that. They're in great shape is when you add all this up, they're making about 3.7 to $4 billion a year in TV revenue. Big number. More important to me is this number here, the term. They've got very, very lucrative contracts locked up for four or five years out. So they're going to get big checks every year for an extended period of time. Very, very important in this climate. Matter of fact, this DirecTV deal right here, who has, uh, what's the NFL Sunday ticket? Anyone have that where you subscribe to it? Very, very lucrative business. Um, DirecTV just upped that. Uh, the current contract pays the NFL $700 million a year. They already renewed that from 2011 to 2014 at a billion dollars a year. Significant increase. But it talks about the value of the NFL. Yes? I don't, but they're not doing well. And it goes to the distribution argument. They are absolutely strapped and struggling. Matter of fact, Comcast has taken them to court. They are struggling getting distribution. And, and great question because the world has changed. It's a very, very difficult time right now to launch a new network and get on what we call expanded basic cable or the lower tiers of cable where you can maximize your ad revenue. Cable operators and satellite providers want to put you on digital tiers where the consumer has to buy into about a $90 price point before they get the NFL network. And that's what the NFL network is arguing with, uh, with, uh, with cable operators, particularly with Comcast. They want to be available at a much lower price point. So um, NFL network struggling mightily uh, in that regard. Uh, 
The NFL is doing well, and they've actually propped up the NFL Network by putting product over there, but it hasn't been enough because there's so much out there on their other rights partners to make the NFL Network compelling that the cable operators and the satellite providers are caving in. So it's, it's really, a, it's, a, it's a, been about a three-year battleground. Major League Baseball, all their deals go through 2013. I don't even look at the, at the annual revenue. I mean, obviously, you have to look at it, how much money do they make. But if you add it all up, it's roughly $650 million a year they make. But they're locked up to 2013. <coughs> so they're in, they're in good shape. NASCAR revenue. This is so important because NASCAR is so subjected to sponsorship money. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. But they just redid their TV deals not too long ago. Took them out to 2014. Very lucrative deals when NASCAR was really riding a, a, a big high. So um, their deals a total $550 million a year across three networks. NBA has almost everything embedded with uh, Disney. ESPN, ABC, AOL, Time Warner, uh, NBA TV is managed by Turner Studios right down the street here. Um, and they get close to a billion dollars a year uh, in revenue. And they redid those deals just last year, so they go out to the end of the 15-16 NBA season. Again, the term is so important right now um, uh, because of the economic climate. College sports. Um, CBS uh, pays... Um, the NCAA, $545 million a year for March Madness, just for the month of March. We're talking about just the basketball tournament. And they just redid that deal not too long ago, took it out to 2015. So that deal's locked up long term, very important to the NCAA. Anyone know about the SEC deal? Uh, some little thing slipped to like page 23, I think, right under the obits that happened this past year. Um, SEC, huge, huge increase. And uh, I can you know, read my book when I retire. I'll tell you some of the stories. It was a, Camille, how many PowerPoints do we do for the SEC? Quite a few. Um, and uh, hugely successful. I mean, the SEC, I'm a big Penn guy. I went to Michigan State, throw your f food at me, but you beat us up in the Capital One Bowl. SEC football, I'm Mike, I get it. Absolutely the best football in the country. I don't care what anyone says. It is absolutely the best football before this deal. It's the only college conference that had a national network uh, TV deal for its football package. So that if Georgia was just crushing Tennessee in a game, you know, it was on national TV and it was seen across the country. There weren't regional sub games anywhere else. Very, very valuable product. Congratulations to Commissioner Sly. The CBS package, um, which is football and basketball, $55 million a year for 15 years. The ESPN package, $150 million a year for 15 years. Um, and, uh, and because it goes out so long term, um, they're in great shape. The side note on this is the projected money share that goes to each school before this deal was done, I believe it was about $5.3 million a school. And I think now it's something like $15 million a school will flow out of this package to each, each member institution. What's that compared to uh, Notre Dame's deal with NBC? What, are they, what is NBC taking on Notre Dame? Pop quiz. Dog guy. Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, uh, and NBC re-upped that a few years back. Um, I, I don't know the numbers on that off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, significantly more, though, but just, you know, not even in the same realm. Here's one that's in big trouble. This is the NHL, and I love the NHL. They have a year-to-year -year contract with NBC, and they have a deal with the Versus Network, which is a network owned by Comcast, that pays them $67 million a year for the next three years or two years. $67 million a year is the only banked money they have. The deal with NBC is actually a what we call a barter deal. NBC televises the games, they produce the games, they sell the advertising, and then whatever money they make from the advertising, they first off the top of that money take their production costs, which at the network level with unions and Talent fees, I would guess, $100,000 a game, maybe $120,000 a game to produce a hockey game, particularly with high def. They also take off the top, though, 
what they perceive as the cost of their airtime. So they've got a three hour slot or a two and a half hour slot on a Saturday afternoon. They'll probably price that at about $150,000 worth of airtime value. So they, they'll take that off the top. So call it, just for the sake of discussion, $250,000. They sell $300,000 in advertising for that game. That's $50,000 net after their airtime and production. They split that 50-50 with the league. The NHL gets $25,000 a game. But they need the exposure. They've got to have the exposure. It's a year-to-year -year deal. Very, very, very challenged for the NHL. Their future um, is, is going to be very challenged in this, in this difficult sponsor market. Let's talk about corporate sponsorships. How am I doing time-wise, Camille? Pretty good? Um, IEG is a company that um, represents uh, their clients in terms of sponsorships, in terms of activation. In January, they did a, uh, they did a survey. 51% of their clients plan on spending less, and this is a sponsorship company, spending less in 09 than they do in 08. 36% said they're going to spend at the 08 level, so they're not going to increase. 47% said they're going to look to escape. Their clients are actually looking to escape current sponsorships. Buick and Tiger Woods, let's remember that. They want to escape the deals. We can't afford them anymore. 45% of the CMOs at their clients said we're spending more time managing agencies than we did two years ago. Managing agencies because we need to manage our costs is what that means. And only 21% of the CMOs said we're getting our best work from our agencies. So, you know, the, the message I hear here is the agencies need to deliver value. Ad agencies, sponsor agencies, you need to deliver value because your clients are really tightening their belt. And, and you really need to not just be a facilitator of buying media, you need to help them with solutions. There was one other piece here that I, I left off, and I think it was something like 51% of CMOs said the measurement for our investment or our relationship with agencies is a direct ROI, activation. It's no longer do people remember the Nike swoosh. It's our shoes of Nikes moving off the shelves. Big, big difference. It's no longer do you remember the Clydesdales or cases of beers flying off, cases of beer flying off the shelves. Um, it's a complete ROI business now. It's not about brand. It's about selling product. Corporate sponsorships. In my business, in, in the sports business, the two big torpedoes are auto and financial industries. GM, their quarterly report. $9.6 billion loss for the quarter. They are the top U.S. marketer in sports. They spend $500 million a year. This year, didn't buy a single ad in the Super Bowl. Not one. Prior year, they had 11 spots. And over the past five Super Bowls, they spent $46 million. A lot of money coming out of the market. Cadillac, out of the Masters. Didn't see him on TV last week. Pontiac, Final Four. <coughs> Michigan State story again, forgive me. Final Four. It was great on Saturday. We had a lousy Monday. Um, <laughs> Pontiac's a host, a, a title sponsor of the Final Four. Zero activation in Detroit. Couldn't afford it. Probably read, they didn't even use their suites because the bailout money, they didn't want to be perceived as having, you know, suites and catering and all that. So they, the suites went dark during the Final Four. Minimal presence in the Daytona 500. We talked about Tiger Woods already. Mercedes-Benz, let's go overseas, foreign car manufacturer. Huge sponsor of the ATP tennis tour. Again, very dependent on sponsorships. Mercedes-Benz cuts way, way back. So heading into the season, six of 63 ATP tennis tournament stops don't even have a sponsorship now. So they're, they're in jeopardy. Financial services is the other big one. I don't think I need to tell anyone in this room, even if you're you know, just skim the paper once a month that Citibank or Citigroup and the Met Stadium before the bailouts, if you will, or the loans hit, um, Citigroup committed to a 20-year, $400 million title sponsorship for the Met Stadium, Shea, the old Shea Stadium in New York, and they have been getting blasted for it ever since, just absolutely blasted. So on the heels of that, Bank of America was actually in deep negotiations to do not necessarily a title sponsorship, but a deep, deep sponsorship with a new Yankee stadium up the road in the Bronx. They saw what Citigroup was getting, and they said, well, we're out, taking our bags, we're going home, we don't want to be part of that. Wachovia, uh, which was acquired by Wells Fargo, 
they escaped a contract that they had through 2014 to be the title sponsor of the PGA Tour Wachovia Championship. It's played in Quail Hollow in, uh, in North Carolina. It's now called the Quail Hollow Championship because they can't get a title sponsor for it. Auto and financial services, huge spenders in the world of sports, both you know, getting government money. They can't face the, uh, the music in terms of justifying it in terms of corporate sponsorships. Talked about NASCAR a moment ago. I just want to give you one pager on that. TV rights deals are long term, but the sponsorships are driving up. Thank God the TV rights deals are long term. Sponsorship uh, money equals 80% of the revenue at the team level. Huge amount of, of dependence on sponsorships. Uh, sponsorships cover 65 to 70% of a team's operating costs. Obviously, because that's dried up, you've got some of the most competitive and thought to be the most successful teams in NASCAR merging. Petty Enterprises merged with Gillette Everham, or Gillette Everham earlier this year. Dale Earnhardt Enterprises, or Dale Earnhardt, Dale Earnhardt Inc., uh, merged with Chip Ganassi and Felix Sabatis Racing. These used to, this is like the Yankees and the Mets, you know, merging. The Georgia and Tennessee, we've decided to merge and be, you know, be partners. Stop it. Are you kidding me? <laughs> and you all let Tennessee run the thing. I mean, that would really be ridiculous, wouldn't it? Uh, ISC, this is International Speedway Corporation. This is the company that owns the tracks. They're feeling the pinch, too. Income, uh, net income is down 31%. Revenues are down 14%. Consumer spending, just kind of, a, we'll fly through this because we talk about rights deals. We talk about corporate sponsorships. Here's kind of the third tier of revenue. NFL attendance last year was down 1%. They expect it to be, be a deeper decline this year. Playoff tickets for this past year were already reduced 10%. Teams are banking on PSLs, premium seating licenses. This is money you pay up front before you buy the tickets. Um, there's three stadiums that are being built. Um, New York Giants are building a, uh, they're moving into a new stadium in 2010. Stadium's going to cost $1.3 billion. Because the, the access and the cost of money has gone up, they are now charging premium seating licenses to fans to buy a ticket. So you've got to lay out money, and then you have the privilege of buying the ticket. Here's a quick scenario for the Giants. The, the, the premium seating license, one story I, I read in the paper in preparing for today, a fan who had season tickets, now in the new stadium, has to buy the, a premium seating license for a pair of tickets at $7,500 a ticket. So a guy wants to take his wife to the Giants game. So now he's got to lay out $15,000 to own those two seats. Then it's $400 a ticket for 10 games a year times two tickets. That's another $8,000. To be a consumer season ticket holder, this guy's got to shell out $23,000 to, to go to the Giants as a season ticket holder in 2010. Now the PSL, the premium seating license, is a one-time expense. Who's got $23,000 to spend to go to, to be a Giants fan? I'm fine with that. They can still more watch the game on Fox. <laughs> I read also that the uh, the Cowboy premium seating license. That Cowboys are, you know, they're building this Taj Mahal of a stadium. I don't know if anyone's heard about the stadium. This stadium in, in Dallas is going to have a high def TV from the 20 yard line to the 20 yard line suspended hanging in the middle of the stadium on both sides. A high def TV from the 20 to the 20. And it's an architectural marvel that the thing doesn't just completely cave in. But the cost of money, the, the cost of money um, um, to build the stadium has gone up significantly. I was just reading the other day, the Cowboys are looking to raise $753 million just on premium seating licenses, just on, on the, the cost of owning the, t the, the seat before you buy the ticket. So they're looking to sell 55,000 seats with a premium seating license. Pull my notes off here. And the licenses go for the really lousy seats, $2,000 a game. Premium seating license, $150,000 a ticket. A ticket. And then you got, or for the, the seat, and then you got to buy the ticket. So they're looking to raise $753 million just from premium seating licenses alone. So, you know, you want to buy a season ticket to a Cowboy game, and you want to sit at the 50-yard line 20 rows up, $300,000 just to own the chair, but now you got to buy the ticket to sit in the chair that you own. Go figure. It's a great business if you can get the money, I guess. So, 
Um, by the way, everyone today, I'm charging you $2,000, a premium seating license to sit in your chairs. <laughs> Breakfast is on me. I hope you eat, eat up. Um, Major League Baseball, attendance fell 1%, first decline they had in four seasons. 16 of 30 teams announced a pricing freeze for this, this current season. Um, NBA um, renewals are down, ticket sales renewals are down, you know, same story, reduced pricing plans announced, Bobcats yesterday announced that they're doing a, uh, and Charlotte Bobcats are a team that, that we have licensed, it's uh, one of the one of the three NBA teams that, that uh, Fox Sports and Sports South televises, um, they're reducing their tickets 17% uh, next year, Talladega uh, attendance was down 50,000, uh, a year ago and advanced ticket sales for the current uh, NASCAR season are down 15 percent. Okay, last slide. What does this all mean? Kind of the big bullets to pull away from this. Most major leagues are safe. The big leagues are pretty safe because they got a lot of money locked up in long-term deals. And that not only is important for their stability in terms of surviving or, 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 or weathering the storm, but that helps them with a great line of credit. The NFL and the NBA would not have gotten that money without those, those guaranteed TV rights deals. NHL, got some issues. NASCAR, pretty good, but they're still very dependent on sponsorships. Uh, arena football, WNBA, some big challenges. Team athlete dependence on corporate sponsorships and consumer spending is testing the limits of financial elasticity. Premium seating licenses, luxury suites, Teams are very dependent on the revenue they get from luxury suites because teams have to share ticket sales revenue with the leagues. In virtually every league, the, the, the numbers are different, the percentages are different, but the Braves send some number, some percentage of their revenue from sitting in, in the stadium to Major League Baseball, but they keep the luxury revenue. That's their money to keep 100% for themselves. But, but companies can't afford to buy those luxury suites anymore. I mean, Pontiac goes dark at the Final Four in Detroit with their suites. Networks will continue to drive higher rights fees for content that delivers sponsorship and viewership. The SEC, great example. I mean, the, the increases that they drove this year are phenomenal. And you'll see that you know, trend continue because we need the content to survive. You know, I am a sports network. Guess what I am if I don't have sports rights? I'm unemployed. I have nothing. Sorry, Camille. Don't let that freak out. Um, so we have to invest in acquiring content that drives viewership, that attracts sponsors, but we got to be very smart about it. And, you know, in, in my shop, I mean, there's more justification and rationale exercises than ever before in my career because dollars are, dollars are, are you know, scarce and the investments have got to be very strategic. And networks must reinvent themselves to create um, greater revenue streams to monetize their investment. What that means is traditional TV is over. You know, when we come through the back end of this economic downturn, I'm not going back out to advertising agencies and saying, the cost per point in Atlanta is $200, and I'm going to deliver a 3.6 rating, and, you know, men adult, adult 25 or, you know, to 46 or whatever, uh, -uh I got to deliver value. I mean, for the same reasons the CMOs are saying, I'm not worried about brand, I'm worried about moving product, I got to do the same thing with my business. Fortunately, unlike a broadcast station, in my business, I own the rights. I control the production. As Cecil said, we produce, and again, this is just my business here in Atlanta, between our networks, we produce 900 sporting events a year. We are the rights holders for three NBA teams, the Hawks, the Bobcats, the Memphis Grizzlies. We're the rights holders for three NHL teams, the Thrashers, uh, the Carolina Hurricanes, the Nashville Predators. We're the largest producer of Braves games. We'll do 105 Braves games this year. We're a rights holder in the SEC, a rights holder in the ACC, um, individual school deals, including Georgia, Tennessee, Kentucky. Um, so we produce 900 events a year. Um, by owning those rights, controlling those productions, controlling the distribution networks, I've got to work those levers to provide the best value I can for my advertisers, and for my affiliates, my cable operator customers, and my satellite customers. And, and that's the business we're in. I also have to do a much better job of leveraging and creating new platforms. I've got to take advantage of the internet. I've got to take advantage of video on demand. I've got to take advantage of, of how I can, through production, instead of selling you a 30-second chunk of time, integrate you into the telecast 
because no one else can do it. My dear friends at Fox 5 down the street have American Idol two nights a week and they're getting great numbers. But they cannot put the Coca-Cola cup in front of Simon Cowell. I can. I can do that because I produce those games. I, I own those rights. And that's the unique opportunity that I have to do with our business to, to stay in the game going forward. That's it. Any questions, anyone? How did I do time-wise? Not bad. A little lower. Seven minutes over. Uh, let me just mention, uh, we do have time for questions, but uh, we're doing a podcast of this, and it's a pretty uh, broad room. So if you've got a question, please raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you, and that way everyone will hear your question, and we'll also be able to record it. I've stunned the room. Yes, sir. The NFL, though, they have long-term contracts. NBA have long contracts. If, if for some reason that company that has, you know, that has a contract goes into bankruptcy, uh, has some kind of financial problem, are they still liable to to pay? Well, probably. Uh, the, the question is if uh, if uh, the NFL or or some of the leagues that have long-term contracts, if those rights holders go into bankruptcy, what's the exposure there? Um, Personally, I hope that never happens. Um, um, you know, probably would go through the normal process of, of, of um, you know, whatever the bankruptcy process is, but I, I don't see that happening. I mean, um, uh, it would behoove, if you take it to that extreme, it would behoove the network and the league to probably renegotiate the deal, restructure the financials of the deal, because if the team doesn't get national exposure, that's not a good option. So they probably need to restructure the deal to keep the exposure, to keep the sponsorship revenue going, so on and so forth. Anyone else? Yes, sir. I'm just curious. Uh, With the change in the economy, what are you doing to do to cut cost and to manage your counterparty risk, your credit risk? I'm so glad you asked that question. I am. I am proud to answer that question because one of the things that News Corp um, delivered, the message News Corp delivered to their operating heads immediately was we're not going to um, protect our operating income by slashing jobs. We're, that's not the strategy we're going to employ. And, and, you know, right from Rupert Murdoch, I have to be honest with you, you know, you can look at me and say, oh, yeah, he's a company guy, single line. Very impressed. Mur Mr. Murdoch's message was, we don't contribute to uh, the downturn by putting our employees on the street. So that being said, the message was, we're not cutting heads. We're staying committed to our investments to move into the world of high def and, and technology. So don't think you can cut that either, because increasingly, as plasma TVs move into the home and TV, uh, tube TVs move to the curb, um, people expect more high def. Um, so it's it's really get smart about your business. It's it's what I said on the last page here. Don't think about traditional advertising sales. Look for new delivery streams. You know the internet. Um, I saw an interesting statistic. One percent of the American public, right now this year, watches TV via the internet. Hulu and and some of those you know internet sites where you can watch TV. I remember. Earlier in my career, um, we were partners, the company I worked for was partners with NBC, and an executive financial person from NBC said, the network business is in great shape. Even though cable's coming up, 96% of Americans still watch network television over cable. That number's like 30% now. So don't be fooled by the fact that, oh, it's only 1% of the American public watches TV via the internet. That number could grow in 20 years. We need to be in a position to be part of that growth rather than try and jump on it 20 years from now. It's those types of things we're really looking at. Anyone else? Can I spend 20 minutes talking about my networks? Yes, sir, I saw your hand first. I'll come over to you. Say again, sir? The 15-year contract for the SEC? Yes. I didn't do it. Not me. CBS and ESPN did it. Um, the SEC is interesting. You know, uh, our company, Fox, uh, partnered with the Big Ten and created the Big Ten Network. 
um, the SEC uh, looked at that as a possibility for uh, assigning their rights in the future. And for a good two, two and a half years in our discussions with the SEC, they really talked long and hard about should we create an SEC network. It's a very big risk. It sounds like a real sexy thing to get involved in television. It's a huge risk with capital issues, with distribution or exposure issues. You know, we talked earlier about the NFL network. You can launch an SEC channel, but if cable operators don't carry it, you've got a lot of really upset fans, you've lost ad revenue, you've lost distribution revenue, and, and you know, it could happen to the SEC because the NFL is still suffering with that. So I think they want the long-term security. I know it was very important for the commissioner to have a national network presence, uh, cable and broadcast TV. I know that uh, brand was important, so when you see coming this fall on ESPN and CBS, it will say the SEC on CBS, the SEC on ESPN. I will let you in on a little insight. Um, part of the ESPN deal, <coughs> excuse me, is anything that CBS didn't buy, ESPN owns. So basically they bought everything else. Inherent in the ESPN deal is ESPN's obligation to do a, a regional contract that will include football and basketball and up to 200 events. Um, and we are and have been for about four months now, been in very, very active, deep negotiations um, with ESPN to be that regional rights holder for them. They, the SEC mandated that so many events get televised that ESPN just doesn't have the ability to televise all those events. Um, ESPNU has very, very poor distribution in the SEC footprint. It's, it's really tough to find. Um, I know Comcast doesn't carry it, several other cable operators don't carry it. So they're looking to us to fulfill some of that tonnage of programming that they promised the SEC. And uh, hopefully we'll have an announcement uh, soon. So. Okay, I think I, we're... Uh, I have one more question Okay, here. one more. Sorry. I, I was wondering if you could speak about, uh, with respect to distributing the NHL and building awareness, that NHL is much bigger in Canada. And uh, do you have any, do you have any uh, knowledge about the revenue that the Canadian broadcasting networks generate? Significantly greater. So I, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. Significantly greater. I mean, hockey and curling, the national sports of Canada. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if it's on ice, we're sliding things on ice, we'll pay for it. Um, uh, it is, you know, in Canada, Hockey Night in Canada is a monster business. Hockey Night in Canada is just the news show around every single game with Don Cherry. Huge business with the exception of markets like Detroit, used to be Colorado, you know, Philadelphia, New York, it's, it's, a, struggling, it's a struggling business. Very niche programming. Very, very niche programming. Um, and, and without the money flowing from a network deal to the teams, the teams um, are forced um, and under the greater pressure to generate their own revenue streams, whereas an NBA team, an NFL team, or a Major League Baseball team gets a hefty uh, check uh, as part of their right share from a national TV contract, the NHL teams don't enjoy that revenue stream, so they're really challenged to generate their own revenue streams. Okay. Jeff, thank you very much thank for being with much. us today. My pleasure. Thank you. On behalf of the Terry College and our alumni board, I'd like to present you with this glass sculpture from uh, a local artist, Paul Benzunas. That's um, outstanding. Thank very you very, much. very much. Appreciate it. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Remember, as you're leaving the parking deck, um, if you say Terry Third Thursday, that, uh, that takes care of the parking. So uh, say that, and I uh, hope to see you next month. <laughs>